thousand. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, yes, that photo is from when I used to be cool, you know, pre having children, child, singular. God, it feels like more than one. Uh, it's uh, getting late. Everybody's been sitting on a couch for a while. So I feel like everyone should, you know, do one of these things where you like stand up, do one of these. Oh, yeah, she's our soul. Okay. So should we do it too? And, uh, and then we can, uh, we can blow through this next part. So I'm going to try to make it very short and sweet so that you guys have a couple of points that are very memorable. Uh, I was given 15 minutes. Let's see if we can't uh, get through this with some really great points in like, I don't know, seven or eight minutes. So buying the right equipment for you. Think about that time when you were buying your very first car. You had no idea what you were doing. You kind of just bought the first thing that came to mind. That's pretty much what buying your first set of equipment's like. Uh, and so I would recommend that everybody just do a little bit more research. Depending on how much you plan to skydive and what type of skydiving you're gonna do, it is worth waiting a little bit, renting for a bit longer, borrowing. Uh, before making that initial investment. So ask lots of questions. There's usually lots of people around and we're skydivers. We're all A personalities. We love to talk and we love to share our opinions, which means that you're never gonna have a shortage of people willing to answer your questions. When you're looking to buy gear, ask lots of people. Uh, then when it comes to downsizing, uh, the biggest piece that I like to put in is that even if you're really good at flying and landing your parachute, even if you've got lots of speed flying time, uh, you potentially don't have the skills to fly the opening. So it's one of the biggest things I see is when people downsize too quickly, they end up with a lot more cutaways. Uh, you actually shouldn't end up with very many cutaways in your career. Um, they should happen like every thousand or 2000 jumps. If they're happening more than that, then you need to question some of the other things that are happening in your skydiving progression, uh, including <laughs> downsizing too quickly. So I think everybody has kind of beaten this subject to death in the last years. A lot of downsizing commentary on Facebook, et cetera. Uh, I would just urge you to consider flying your openings as part of your decision-making process for downsizing as well. Um, learning new disciplines. Again, same thing as my previous comment. There's lots of people out there that really want to share their advice. Yes, there's lots of people that charge a lot of money for coaching and that sort of thing, but most of us like to talk. We're, you know, pretty full of ourselves and like to share the knowledge that we've spent lots of money to gain. So ask a lot of questions uh, and learn about new disciplines that way. I think our pilots have already gone over aircraft briefing and awareness. Wearing the right gear for the skydive. I'm sure you guys have noticed that skydiving gear is very much like skinny jeans versus bell bottoms. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that people wore the Dekine rags that were these like massive flowy things that like me and Allison could both fit in at the same time. Uh, that's changed. That's just a trend, right? Skydiving has its trends. So it's more a matter of wearing what you need to wear in order to actually be in the skydive. <laughs> Right, so yes, it matters uh, what you wear so that you can be successful. Trends are gonna contribute to that, but then also the size of the people that are in the skydive. Um, so I would again urge you to just consider what the skydive is that you're doing at that time and uh, do a little bit of self-reflection. I would also say consider your landing area and whether you're likely to have a muddy ass upon um, your return to the drop zone. Uh, where are we at? Planning for a successful skydive. Just plan out a skydive. I would just add to this that it's really a great idea to plan out your landing as well. And that goes right into the next point I'm supposed to cover, which is setting SMART goals. So you guys have heard the acronym S-M-A-R-T, which I think stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, uh, Realistic, Relevant. Timely. Uh, I would say have a short-term goal and have a long-term goal. Uh, so short-term, what am I going to do on this skydive or what do I want to accomplish this weekend? And what do I want to do for this season? Um, so that to me is really important because if you want to become a PFF instructor, probably a good idea for you to do some belly skydives. All right. Where it's at right now is free flying. But if you want to actually be successful as a PFF instructor, you're probably going to need to spend some time doing some four-way belly skydiving. So set some goals for yourself. If you just want to have a good time and like, you know, Dan Grant said, just have a fuckload of fun, then great. You don't have to do a ton of planning for that. Uh, but if you want to actually have some longer term goals, then your short term goals should probably help you get to there. 
All right, this one I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on. This one I think is important. Awareness and procedures in unusual canopy situations. So there's two pieces I'm gonna cover on this one. So one of them is opening in clouds. So we don't specifically plan to open in clouds. We're not supposed to open in clouds, but it does happen. And I find a lot of people aren't really clear on what you're supposed to do when you suddenly find yourself in a cloud. So assuming you've done a four-way skydive, so that's usually about the biggest that we're gonna get most of the time when we're jumping out of a 182. You might get a six-way if you're in the 206. Either way, my hope is that you've broken off and you've gotten each into your own sort of quadrant uh, by breaking off and tracking at an appropriate altitude. So from here, if everybody opens, they check their gear, they keep kind of flying in their own quadrant, at that moment, if everybody realizes that they're in a cloud, they should just spiral within their quadrant. So the idea is instead of meandering aimlessly through a cloud in an unknown direction, you're instead just gonna stay in your quadrant. So you should sort of just corkscrew. And that's what everyone should do while maintaining altitude awareness so that you're not just coming out at the ground or you know at a barn or something. Uh, but generally speaking, let's hope that the clouds don't go all the way down to ground level at this point or you've made some very poor decisions. Uh, and then you should be able to come out and hopefully see everybody else. So having some awareness of where everybody is before that break off happens and then just staying within your quadrant. Uh, but don't make the mistake of just flying through the cloud that could be very dangerous as you're not going to be able to see the other traffic. The other piece that I'd like to cover for this one is canopy collisions and more specifically how to speak when you're in an emergency. So the biggest piece that I want to emphasize with this is to speak in positives. So don't ever say what you don't want to do, say what you do want to do. So communication is really key. So we could talk about this in the sense of it can be collision, but it could apply to other emergencies as well. For example, you would not want to say, do not cut away. Because if somebody happens to be wrapped in the fabric of your parachute, they may only hear cut away, and then they would potentially be cutting away into you, okay? Uh, so you want to speak in positives. Keep the parachute and keep up that communication. Altitude awareness is key. So I actually recommend that people get in the habit of yelling their altitude even to themselves under canopy, specifically in emergency situations. How often have you guys like picked up your phone to check the time, got distracted, looked back at it to realize, oh right, I forgot to check the time. Altitude is like that too. It's really easy to look at your altimeter, go, oh, oh shoot, I didn't actually look at it. So if you're in an emergency situation, get used to screaming out what that altitude is. If you're yelling, I'm at 2,500 feet, you are going to register it. It's also important to be verbalizing that to somebody else if you are in a canopy collision, all right? Because maybe that person can't see an altimeter if they're wrapped in your fabric, okay? But if they're wrapped in your fabric, it's important for you to be the one that disconnects before they do, because you don't want them to disconnect into you. We could talk about that for a lot longer, but I'm already going a little longer than I wanted to. So I'm just gonna end with my, uh, my last little piece, which is uh, always finish your flare. Uh, don't worry, my 11 month old daughter will certainly have those as her first words, uh, but I'm just gonna get Nick. Nick's got a much better range of motion than I do right now. So we're just gonna make sure that we remember that uh, when, you're, when you're flaring, you wanna make sure you get your hands all the way up like you're being arrested. So up as high as you possibly can. So notice that I've got my hands up as high as they'll possibly go right now. And then I wanna flare, 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 all the way down, full range of motion, all right? So just one more, all the way up, hands all the way up, way above your head, as high as you can. And then flare, flare, flare. Great, rotating the wrists all the way down to get that full flare. Nice work, David. All right. Erica, thank you so much. Uh, and again, Erica, as I said, just had sh shoulder surgery yesterday. So she's a trooper for being here and she's tired and all that fun stuff. 